Good morning. It's wonderful to have mothers that feed us and clothe us and teach us and guide us and counsel us in our lives. When I was young, I never, ever said the word mother or mom. When I was a bit an infant, my real biological mother was institutionalized. But I had a whole bunch of mothers. My grandmother, my aunt, Marilyn. Ladies that taught Bible class at church, that's you. Your moms to kids, your moms to them. And we thank God for you. And God has given you flowers today. The blackberries are blooming. The magnolias, they started blooming this week. Did you notice that? The magnolia trees blooming. And I told you blackberry winter was coming. And here it is today. Right? Good thing we have these tissues up here. I got a little game for you. A lot of cities have nicknames. What's the nickname for your New York City? The Big Apple. What's the nickname for Chicago? Okay. Charlotte. That's right. You all know your cities, don't you? What's the nickname for Indianapolis? Indy. It's actually called the Circle City. It's called the Circle City. And uh, that little one there in that picture is standing way in front of the circle itself. If you look at this picture in the background, there is a huge monument. It's called the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in downtown Indianapolis. Anybody been there? Raise your hand. A few of you have. You know, it's, it's a beautiful area, it, and it's a circle. There's a circle right there around uh, that monument, and all the roads come to it. All the roads come to that circle. And so Indianapolis is called the Circle City. There you go. I'm educating you today. And I took this picture one evening when we were down there trying to see the Christmas lights at the circle. See? Isn't that pretty? And here, by the way, is a, is a, a, a picture of the planning of the town of Indianapolis in 1820. And if you just look at it, you see the, how the roads crisscross, and you have the circle right there in the middle where that monument exists. Uh, when I was a kid, it, Christmas time, sometimes uh, in choral groups, they would take us down to that, to the monument. We would stand there and we would sing Christmas songs in downtown Indianapolis, right where the roads crisscrossed. And I'm saying all this because this morning I want to talk about, briefly, being cross-centered. Cross-centered. The Bible itself is cross-centered. And that Old Testament things look forward to the cross, pointing to the cross in the center, okay? So the Old Testament, with its promises to Abraham, the promise of the seed fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the law and its sacrifices that foreshadowed the necessary death of Jesus for our sins, the Davidic covenant that spoke of his rule as the Messiah, and the many, many, many prophecies of Jesus from his birth in Bethlehem to his, to, to his anguish at the cross, Psalm 22, to his, his death for our sins, Isaiah 53. All this Old Testament looked forward to 
the crucifixion of Christ. God had a plan for our salvation, and all the Old Testament looked forward to the fulfillment of that plan. So uh, the Bible looked forward to it, and then, there we go. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus spoke of the Old Testament pointing to him. He said this to the two on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. You remember? He said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, that's the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The Jewish people grouped the Old Testament in these three things, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And all of those, Jesus said, pointed to him. They must be fulfilled. And he says, thus it is written in these Old Testament passages, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. The Old Testament looked forward to the cross. And the New Testament looks back at the cross. Isn't that interesting? You have the Old Testament, the, 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 the scriptures of the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of Christ, looking forward to his death and resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of the Father, looking forward to the coming of the kingdom, the church. And then you have the New Testament. All of it looks back at what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. His sacrifice for our sins. He made salvation possible. He established the church. And, and his, his death has an effect on our personal lives. The cross of Christ has an effect on every one of us in our individual lives. The Bible is cross-centered. And your life is cross-centered. In Galatians chapter 2. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the Bible is cross-centered, and the cross is at the center of my life as well. And I missed one of my points. <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. And the Lord's Supper, of course, is cross-centered, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of my favorite verses in that, that, that chapter is the simple verse 26 that so simply explains the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what the Lord's Supper is in all of its simplicity. A remembering of Jesus' death for us. And so the cross is at the center of the Bible. The cross is, at, is to be at the center of my life. And the cross is at the center of what we're doing in this very moment in time. And partaking of the Lord's Supper.